um, what are the critiques that have been uh, lifted by geographers on uh, the concepts and the theories? What is then sort of the research agenda for a geography of sustainability transitions, but also what are sort of initial findings and reflections uh, when starting to really uh, look at the geography of sustainability transitions? In that, I will also uh, briefly reference some of our empirical work we did, which we did on biorefineries. And then I'll talk a bit more at length about uh, my experience from the past three years before I just came to Bergen in January this year, where I was working um, at this University of Melbourne as the City of Melbourne Chair of Resilient Cities. And I was sort of involved in, in what you could call actually an experiment of a local government um, sort of uh, collaborating with the university um, around a sustainability resilience um, initiative. Okay, um, I have to be a bit quick here. Um, so I think this picture sort of tells a lot about sort of what I find uh, interesting and appealing in the sustainability transitions literature. Um, on the one hand, it subscribes to the optimism and the sort of emancipatory um, potential of change and innovation. Um, but it also shows that, um, you know, there's a risk of what people sometimes call innovationism, of basically brushing over uh, resistance, uh, unintended consequences, and if you like, dark sides of innovation. And increasingly, I think empirically, we are being faced by the fact that there is also really resistance against change. And especially if you talk about disruptive innovation, transformative innovation, um, voices that articulate resistance um, are, are increasingly louder. Um, I'll, I mean, the, the people in, in our course at Resin Reg at HVL have already been immersed quite a bit in the concepts and theories of sustainability transitions. But quickly, sort of to, um, to, to the Bergen School to sort of bring you up to speed, um, this is probably, if you need to sort of just use one slide to explain the sustainability transitions literature or, or, or theories, it's the so-called multi-level perspective. It's really the poster child of sustainability transitions. And it also uh, kind of uh, is a theoretical, if you like, interpretation of, of the Yenis phase I, I showed earlier, where it is a model that both tries to incorporate um, novelty creation, uh, ideation, uh, innovation and agency, through what is called technological niches, but also really tries to conceptualize um, so-called resistance against change, inertia in transformative change, uh, path dependency, uh, and so forth. It's been a very popular concept, um, incredibly popular actually, uh, in terms of citations and so on and so on. Uh, it's also become very influential in sort of setting and influencing policy and recently the European um, Environmental Agency has explicitly adopted the multi-level perspective as sort of a theoretical rationale for, for, uh, for policy. Um, it, it kind of goes back to ecological modernization in the sense that it tries to sort of happily marry um, economic development, social development, and environmental care uh, through um, technological change and progress. But I think some of the critiques that it sort of suggests uh, technological fixes or technological substitution is also a bit too sort of far-fetched because this is sort of work that really acknowledges the social shaping and construction of, uh, of technology. It all talks about social technical systems, it is very appreciative of how institutions enable and constrain chain, uh, change. So um, even though it has sort of takes technology often as a, as a sort of point of departure for, trans, for sustainability transitions, I don't think it's sort of the end all uh, of, um, of transformations. There's obviously more within the broader family of sustainability transitions. Uh, the multi-level perspective is perhaps the dominant perspective, but there are also a lot of people working on how sort of um, new green technologies emerge and diffuse, and in doing so, sort of green our economies by applying technological innovation systems approaches. 
And this field of research is very much characterized by trying to not just sort of analyze transitions, but also to really um, actively in influence, um, shape, and govern them. And you could say that the strategic niche management approach is sort of a translation, a governance translation of the multi-level perspective and provide some um, insights about how, what to do to uh, foster uh, innovation and agency in those niches. Um, and equally, transition management um, really coming out of um, the Drift School in, in Rotterdam um, tries to sort of uh, provide governance insights for how to accelerate uh, sustainability transitions. What this picture also shows is sort of the, um, that, you know, this is sort of building further on, uh, on existing work, uh, very much coming from uh, innovation systems uh, research, uh, the national innovation systems approach, um, and evolutionary economics. So um, I think in sustainability science across the board, uh, and economics has sort of a pretty sort of bad reputation. Um, which has all everything to do with sort of the dominance of neoclassical economics in in this discipline, but there are also obviously heterodox economics that perhaps are less reductionistic and uh, less simplistic, um, but that have something important to say about sort of the economics of sustainability transitions and transformations. Um, what that picture also shows is that geography has not been sort of incorporated uh, early on in theorizing transitions. And sort of that's where, where sort of this lecture comes in. Um, my background is in economic geography. Um, did my PhD in Lund, um, worked on the usual suspects of looking at clusters and knowledge dynamics and regional innovation systems. Um, well, I won't talk about that now, but I, I, it's probably important to acknowledge sort of my take on geography, uh, again, from a sort of epistemological perspective. And here I, I sort of follow in the footsteps of my, my, my former supervisor, Bjorn Assheim, really trying to understand geography as a synthetic discipline that uh, tries to contextualize social theory, social phenomena, economic theory and economic uh, phenomena as well, um, by putting them into place and putting them into a spatial context. So um, as a subdiscipline, economic geography has a lot of flexibility uh, in the sense that it often draws on uh, existing um, theories and concepts uh, from social science and puts them into a sort of spatial, um, situates them in, in space. And so in doing so, it also, there's often always a empirical connection uh, to geographical work in the sense that purely abstract uh, geographical research um, makes, makes little sense. Um, as a subdiscipline, economic geography has been having a very happy relationship, you could even call it a marriage, with innovation studies, um, where uh, the aforementioned innovation systems approach has been very much inf influenced by insights from economic geography around clusters and agglomeration and urbanization economies. And that sort of really found its sort of um, um, way out in the uh, regional innovation systems approach, um, which nowadays also has become really an important um, analytical device and policy making device uh, within the European Union, as it is sort of the, again, the theoretical underpinning for Europe's uh, smart specialization policies and strategies, uh, which are all about sort of, you know, sustainable regional development in Europe um, and providing so social cohesion across Europe's regions. And it has very much sort of reminded non-geographers about the importance of place-based uh, innovation policy. That innovation policy is not about uh, just sort of following shiny examples of Silicon Valley, um, and, and other sort of you know world leading glow, uh, um, clusters, sort of the, the policy mobility um, trap that that Hovard also referenced yesterday, but it is really sort of uh, arguing that um, regions and localities need to first of all um, realize sort of what is what their region has to offer in terms of potential. <clears throat> 
And that's sort of key now in uh, Europe's regional development policy. So I think that is not a little achievement. So when I started to read transitions literature, I, on the one hand, thought this is a, a, a wonderful literature um, to make much better sense of, you know, the some of the dualities in, um, in, in, in sort of green innovation. And what I mentioned earlier on sort of the, the resistance against innovation, but also the sort of the more formative generative aspect of, of uh, uh, innovation. Um, but quickly, um, the geographer in me became quite irritated because there was, there was a lot of sort of spatial metaphors in uh, early transitions theory. Um, but th these were sort of aspatial, spatial metaphors, if you know what I mean. So, for example, this picture, um, I thought, oh, this is very interesting. This is, this is something saying something about sort of the geography or spatial aspects of transitions. But apparently, the local and the global in this model should not be understood as spatial uh, terms, but should be understood as social, sociological terms. Which is nothing wrong with that, but it does create a lot of confusion, um, especially for people working in geography or in spatial studies um, about you know how to make sense of these um, make sense of these uh, models. Um, so that sort of triggered. Uh, lines of thought about sort of so you know what can we really do with sort of foundational transition theory uh, when we really want to make a uh, sense of geography of, uh, of sustainability transitions and um, in doing that we started to sort of formulate a number of criticisms um, the first being um, that a lot of the existing studies and theories sort of suggest methodological nationalism. They take sort of the nation state as a natural point of departure to delineate uh, the social technical or the innovation system that you are looking at. And that's creating all kinds of sort of problems in terms of ascribing causalities and sort of what factors uh, that drive and constrain innovation are endogenous or exogenous to, to a system. Um, as probably, you know, in reference also yesterday in the, in, in the lecture by Hovart, um, these are sort of theories that sort of provide, you know, that subscribe to some sense of theoretical universalism. Um, they should have sort of application wherever you, wherever you go. And again, not being very reflexive perhaps about the fact that a lot of the theory building was, was, um, was informed by very place specific case studies in say Europe uh, and often in sort of developed um, economies and often also in particular sort of political economies with say more sort of coordinated uh, institutional structures rather than neoliberal if you like. Um, also um, the sort of the lack of attention for space uh, made this literature rather myopic to very important structural tendencies like globalization and urbanization um, and in doing so, provided relatively blunt and naive policy repertoires um, that were very much focused again on you know what is happening within our system, uh, within the boundaries of our country, and, and so on and so on. So, uh, despite all these metaphors, um, we made a couple of publications. Um, next to other um, scholars from, from human economic geography, um, sort of trying to set up an, a, an, an agenda uh, for uh, geography of sustainability transitions. And you could say that the agenda consists of three main elements, um, for, or, or, or big questions, if you like. Um, first of all, trying to understand whether and why transitions unfold unevenly across space. Secondly, to analyze whether and how context matters for transition processes. And thirdly, to analyze the governance of transition at and across different scales. So um, after a couple of years, you then start to wonder, so, you know, did, did this agenda setting actually sort of ma make an effect? Um, so a few years later, um, um, Thijs Hansen, a colleague of mine at that time at Lund University, uh, and myself did also a literature review uh, 
um, because we could notice that there, there were uh, quite a lot of studies that started to engage with uh, explicitly the geography of sustainability transitions. Um, it also had sort of become an official sort of uh, element of the sustainability transitions research agenda. Uh, there were various special issues around it. And it's fair to say that it, it did sort of uh, raise some neglected topics um, in the sustainability transitions literature. The importance of urban and regional visions, policies, initiatives. So a, a lot of uh, transition action was actually really um, happening at the subnational level. Um, also, um, the importance of how market creation for um, green technologies, green products, uh, often had a very strong sort of local source of origin. Um, so the social construction of markets was something that, that apparently profited from proximity um, benefits. Um, also, again, you know, regions that seem to be sort of more developed in sustainability transitions often also had sort of uh, clusters or industrial specializations around particular clean tech industries or technologies. And finally, sort of a lot of studies sort of pointed at sort of the, the complexity and the multiscalarity of how transitions unfold and that they don't just fit within one scalar envelope of uh, a country. So there was that debunking of the national fixation of sort of the early theorizations. Um, but we also noticed that a lot of the studies were primarily concerned with uh, niche dimensions, with sort of the agency in sustainability transitions. Where was novelty created? and sort of how did that sort of play out in space. And in that sense, it's very similar to existing work on geography of innovation. Uh, but there was less kind of concern and engagement with the geography of regimes or the, the geography of path dependency and inertia and, and pushback. Um, also, we noted that the geographical perspective, and this is sort of following the, the, the discipline in many ways, were primarily layered on top of existing theories and empirical insights. And I, I think, you know, for example, referencing to, to, to the work of Hovart, it's only quite recently that we start to th sort of theorize differently as geographers about sustainability transitions, not necessarily having to um, acknowledge and build on um, those sort of foundational theories and concepts from transitions literature. Um, and then one important thing, um, oh dear, I'm already getting a five minute alert. This is going to be tricky. I hope you can give me 10 minutes because otherwise I'll have to be too, too brief. Um, an important question for people interested in geographies is when and how uh, place specificities are important for sustainability transitions. There's sort of a, a flourishing of case studies that sort of celebrate, you know, the local factors that, that drive uh, sustainability transitions. But the pushback sort of from non-geographers is, so what? Um, what does this tell us about sort of the bigger picture um, of sustainability transitions? Uh, okay. Let's see, I'm going to skip this now. So I'll use my 10 minutes now to very briefly uh, talk a bit more about urban sustainability transitions. And um, I'm going to fast forward here. Um, so we've, we've released a few years back, we've done a book um, within the Routledge uh, series of sustainability transitions together with Nikki Franciscaki, Vanessa Castanbruto, and uh, Derek Lohrbach. Um, in trying to sort of bring together sort of urban scholars and transition scholars um, around the topic of urban sustainability transitions. And again, it was not easy to sort of bring them really into dialogue because you could sort of see that they just had sort of different sort of takes on the urban and cities here. Uh, for some, they really celebrated that cities are centers of creativity and innovation and therefore are very important for urban sustainability transitions, uh, but also focusing on sort of how cities are very unequal, both within the city and socioeconomic terms, uh, but also how urbanization is fostering sort of growing uh, polarization and inequality. 
lot of sort of theorized urban sustainability transitions as really sort of uh, nexuses of social technical systems where energy systems, transport systems, waste systems kind of come together. And that kind of becomes a very messy uh, sustainability transitions, but a very important one. Um, Others focused on the role of cities and local governments as intermediaries in processes of bringing together how uh, visions of sustainability transitions and sustainable urban futures are being enacted. Um, others focused on how, and I'm going to elaborate more on that in a bit, uh, cities are test beds for sustainability transitions, for sort of novel uh, innovations uh, with regard to urban transformations and also how increasingly cities are networking, forming global city networks um, that potentially become conduits for rapid scaling of urban transformation. I think there of C40, uh, ICLE and other uh, city networks. Um, there's a sort of a, still a, an unresolved debate about you know, where does urban planning figure in all this. Um, there's a nice paper from uh, Caroli 2018 um, but basically the jury is out, um, but what is maybe more interesting now to mention is that there's also a sort of an, an experimental turn in say urban policy, urban sustainability policy, uh, which explicitly sort of um, endorses experimentation as a way to govern uh, urban sustainability. There's a book, The Experimental City, which brings together uh, transition scholars and urban scholars as uh, work from well-known urban theorists uh, on like Simon Marvin and, and Harriet Bulkley on urban living labs, experimenting with city futures. Um, and it's on, on the whole, there's a, there's a lot of work coming out on, on experimentation. Now, the, the three years where I was working in Melbourne, um, I was trying to uh, draw really on this experimentation literature to make sense of um, what the Resilient Melbourne strategy was really about. And this Resilient Melbourne strategy was part of a global initiative of the 100, um, of the 100 Resilient Cities uh, set up by the Rockefeller Foundation. And it, it was a, an urban strategy that was supposed to create resilience against shocks and stresses uh, for metropolitan Melbourne and explicitly try to do that in a transformative, inclusive, participatory way. And it was not sort of part of a formal um, planning process, um, but it sort of was really set up as a um, sort of a, an, an entrepreneurial change agent within local government. Um, and trying to really collaborate and coordinate, uh, reach out with all kinds of different urban stakeholders, uh, both from the private sector to communities to universities. Um, and it did that by, first of all, sort of trying to figure out sort of, you know, what are the important sort of resilience um, challenges for Melbourne? Um, but then sort of as a result of that analysis, kind of quickly come to say 30, 40 projects um, how to then sort of transform uh, metropolitan Melbourne. And in that sense, that emphasis on how um, innovation projects are supposed to drive transformation, I think fits really with the notion of governance experimentation, uh, being purposive uh, interventions designed to respond to the imperative for climate change responses in the city and with a more or less explicit attempt to innovate, learn and gain experience. And, and this is a, a now an, a, a, an important and um, popular concept, um, but I must admit I found it quite difficult to um, translate uh, the notion of governance experimentation really into, uh, say, guidelines um, for policymakers and professionals working within local government. About, so how do you actually set up? How do you do? How do you perform? governance experimentation. Um, so in that sense, um, recently tried to think about what are the organizational principles and institutional structures to design uh, urban experiments. And uh, we published on this in a recent paper in regional studies with um, Sebastian Fastenrath. Uh, and we really looked at, at urban innovations there as boundary objects. Um, and 
on the whole sort of very much uh, try to highlight how boundary management across uh, the public the private you know um, across uh, third sector um, how, how that was sort of a very important um, say organizational principle um, for uh, governance experimentation and thirdly um, which sits a bit uneasy with the emphasis on urban innovations that uh, governance experimentation should really allow for failure that these are um, hopeful monstrosities these projects um, are supposed to basically ask what if questions and, and by asking what if questions should allow to also sort of um, not always turn into shiny successes but in the act of making mistakes, uh, a lot of less, uh, important lessons can be learned. Um, so, in doing this work, it also made me very much rethink um, the notion of innovation, kind of maybe coming from a more Schumpeterian understanding of innovation, uh, focusing on typically firms as being drivers of innovation, uh, where innovation is important for competitive advantage, and uh, now sort of there were multiple social groups and actors that could be seen as innovators and the, the rationale for innovation was not necessarily competitive advantage or economic growth but social environmental needs um key processes in sort of say schumpeterian innovation were typically uh, knowledge exploration and knowledge exploitation whereas in experimentation it is much more focused on co-creation um, experimentation, trial and error, and asking that sort of what if question, not sort of just sort of trying to, um, you know, commercialize and create value out of knowledge. Um, in terms of relations, um, Schumpeterian innovation very much just sort of takes relations and in, instrumental to innovation, whereas there's a more sort of a normative term in experimentation where the relations are uh, explicitly meant to be inclusive, participatory. And again, in Schumpeterian innovation, uh, institutions are often given. They are sort of the rules of the game, the enablers and the constraints for actors under which they operate to innovate. Whereas under um, an experimentation understanding, these institutions are not necessarily only given, but it very much looks at institutional entrepreneurship and how institutions are actually also changing uh, through acts uh, of, uh, of innovation. To conclude, um, apologies for going over time, um, there are obviously also some shortcomings and challenges to this experimental approach, um, where a lot of the co-creation um, also runs into trouble uh, where um, participants start to um, complain about consultation and workshop fatigue, pilotitis. So endless sort of consultations with community groups, etc., etc also tend to kind of uh, create a lot of cynicism. Um, then sort of organizing uh, urban transformation and transitions through uh, these sort of experimental projects um, may, you know, sound appealing in theory, but it also has a dark side in the sense of creating risks of projectification. So projects iner inherently also try to uh, live up to their uh, objectives and to their ambitions and for example find it maybe difficult to talk about what went wrong in the project because they try to uh, further mobilize resources for for the project and to sort of extend the, the, the lifetime of, of a project. Finally um, as academics we tend to be very um, in love with, with, with learning, with policy learning um, but my experiences in working really sort of at the boundary of, of, of research and practice, um, this is maybe a heroic assumption and a, a lot of policy making is, uh, and, and policy decision making is not at all informed by, by policy learning and um, there are way more shady sides to, to the way policy comes about. Um, this is maybe not so much a new thing for many people working in critical studies, but for people working in innovation studies, this is maybe uh, a, a more um, astute uh, observation. And then um, again, in relation to the, you know the projectification, it's important to think about post-experimentation. Um, what happens after the experiment? Uh, 
And again, um, this requires more than just good intentions, and grandiose ambitions, and you know having networks in place. So you know these city networks. The idea is that you know by connecting all these cities and creating sort of plat uh, platforms that these cities are able to share um, you know best practices with each other. But um, findings often sort of show that um, the extent to which there is really sort of deep learning. Um, tend to be quite uh, quite modest and you know really investment in capacity for post experimentation um, is really required in order to um, give experiments also an afterlife so um, apologies for um, being a bit late uh, but um, yeah I think I now open up for uh, questions and um, yeah discussion uh, criticism and so on and so on. Feel free to speak up if you have a question for Lars. There's quite a number of people, so we might not always see you motioning on the screen. Just unmute yourself and go ahead. Hey, Lars, this is Nicholas. Um, I have a question. When we're talking about urban sustainability, I think we often um, uh, uh, do not pay enough attention to the urban rural tra uh, transition or landscape or where those two connect, especially in terms of consumption and, and the way our food systems work. Any thoughts that you have on how to be more inclusive of where urban ends, rural begins, and the, ch and the connections between urban and rural that are important for sustainability? Yeah. Um, thank you. That's a, that's a very... Uh, interesting and important question um, and uh, my experience moving from Europe to Australia um, um, was also that um, I mean the way we think about the urban um, and if you like you know the regional or the rural um, is, is very different um, so here in Europe, I think we often tend to think of uh, cities, uh, sort of city regions. So cities have a hinterland and sort of the, the, the functional uh, territory of a city often sort of includes that, that hinterland. When I then came to Australia, um, people really uh, talked about a very sharp divide between uh, the urban and the regional. Um, the regional there uh, basically was a, a, a negative category in the sense of referring to non-urban, which has a lot to do, of course, with the history of Australia and the fact that 90% uh, of the population lives in large metropolitan areas of you know, over uh, a million people. In that sense, Australia is probably the most urbanized country in the world, even though it's, you know, uh, it, it is also very empty um, in many ways. Um, but you could also notice there that the way that people thought about, uh, think about um, the city is, 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 is far more sort of disconnected um, from, uh, from, from the regional. And that has also created a lot of sort of political tensions um, mm. and challenges in, um, in, in, in Australia with regard to uh, urban growth and led to a lot of uh, urban sprawl and so on and so on. Um, and also um, relates to sort of the risks of polarization. Um, where um, in Australia, sort of, you know, if you're a little bit familiar with the country, you know that the, the, the climate debate is, is very contested and, and, and very polarized. But there's also a geography to that in the sense that sort of the 
um, there's a lot of sort of progressive thought um, and a lot of climate action happening in within sort of the, the, the centers of, of the big cities. And uh, a lot of local governments are, in a sense, even more sort of progressive in many ways than, you know, their counterparts in Europe. But what explains sort of why Australia as a country is very um, um, conservative uh, in terms of climate policy, uh, debilitatingly conservative, is the fact that there's a lot of resistance and climate denial still in uh, sort of the regional uh, parts of the country. Um, but the way that sort of the, um, the um, election system is organized, these regions have excessively large in political influence. So you could say that, you know, that the polarization between the urban and the rural and sort of the fact that maybe cities are seen to, you know, be able to gain from sustainability transitions, whereas regions which often, you know, depend on, say, you know, coal uh, would become the losers has created a, 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 an utterly debilitating standoff politically, um, which is not getting the country anywhere in terms of uh, energy um, policy and climate policy. So um, and I think this is something we need to be, I think in Australia there is in many ways the cannery and the coal mine, uh, in the sense that we see also an increased polarization between the urban and the regional in, uh, in Europe. And uh, work of fellow economic geographer, uh, Professor Andres Rodriguez Post from the London School of Economic, Economics has shown how um, there's a direct sort of link between rising populism and sort of regions and people and regions feeling left behind uh, in terms of economic progress and growing uh, inequality again between uh, you know, the urban innovation fueled economies and, um, and, and regions which feel like, you know, what, what's in it for us. Um, so I think these sort of political realities force us to increasingly acknowledge sort of, you know, what are actually the interconnections between um, urban and, and, and regional um, systems in terms of energy, food and so on. And I think again, in, in a lot of urban studies, which for example, draw on urban me metabolisms, uh, there's a very interesting work showing how, you know, these flows and systems uh, really transcend, if you like, the administrative uh, boundaries of, of, of a city. But that's at the same time kind of creating the challenges that yes, cities are very dependent on sort of their non uh, urban uh, elements of their sort of social technical systems, but there, there are no sort of governance arrangements in place to you know how to how to organize and coordinate those systems. Hope that ah, I see one more question here. Um, urban innovation is a kind of niche regime interaction too. Um, sorry, Rafia, could you elaborate on your question? Yeah, thank you. So basically, when you mentioned this, uh, like a special context or the place a specific, uh, specificity, so then in case of cities, for example, in developing countries, so they don't, like they haven't adopted uh, this like residential solar photovoltaic or maybe the renewable part, it's mostly the grid based electricity. So when you mentioned in your case that, okay, it's uh, urban innovation. So if I define innovation, it can be um, a new tool the world new to the city new to the people in that way or uh, like if i just define like in a broader way to what is innovation so like for example in a country where innovation uh, uh, so, so, like solar photovoltaics is already there in some context but that it is not in the main electricity regime so in that perspective if some cities they do not adopt this solar photovoltaic yet so then can we say that okay this urban innovation is a kind of niche rhythm interactions something like that and that was my question yeah no thanks um now that's um that's something that needs to be clarified um uh, and it is a sort of a a recurrent challenge but also opportunity for people working with, with within innovation studies that um innovation in sort of its um, mundane 
um, intuitive understanding um, often is sort of something you know new to the world um, has sort of that uh, um, allure of, of of novelty and being exciting etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and I think that is also the way it is being measured um, in say quantitative analysis of innovation I mean one proxy for innovation is patents and a pattern by definition has to be it very much emphasizes you know the novelty uh, of, of of a new product or new technology similarly if we look at you know the way that innovation often is, is measured through community innovation surveys from the EU CIS um, they ask, uh, did your organization introduce a new product uh, that is new to the world, right? So th that sort of new to the world um, is something that is very much emphasized in sort of traditional understandings of innovation and innovation studies and innovation policy. Um, I think when we talk about innovation in transitions and in sustainability transformations and um, then we need to sort of get a little bit away from that sort of new to the world understanding of innovation. But it is much more than about sort of the, uh, you know, to what extent the idea, concept, technology, uh, product, service is different compared to say the regime, right? So it, it is, it is it, innovation is always a relative concept. Um, but when you take it into transition studies, I think the, you know, the, the way, how you sort of relative, uh, relate it is, is, is different than in traditional innovation studies. Yeah. Um, Amir here, taking the map of the world, are we going to live vertical or horizontal? <laughs> and which regions or countries are oriented to which direction? Yes, so um, this was obviously a, uh, a vivid debate in Melbourne. Melbourne is also one of the most um, um, uh, it's the opposite of dense. Um, it's one of the cities which has biggest urban sprawl um, in terms of its you know its surface. Um, it, it is one of the largest uh, cities in the world. So it has a, a lot of suburbs um, and um, very sort of low rise, and only sort of the city centre has uh, has some some real urban density, and that urban sprawl is, is really recognised as a major um, issue, uh, sustainability issue for for Melbourne. Um, so immediately, it also kind of gets a lot of people to advocate the compact city, and um, at the same time that creates again, a lot of pushback. Uh, so while whereas Melbourne tries to increasingly densify, um, it, it also does that in a very, if you like, um, in, in a very fast, unreflexive way um, by simply just sort of putting up quickly lots of high rise buildings um, that basically lack any sense of community that lack infrastructure. So it's basically a city that is growing too fast. Um, so I think the, the question that you're asking um, is a question that, you know, asks for caution and that, you know, it's, it's sort of um, alludingly sort of simplistic in the sense of, you know, is it either or? And I think it is less a question about urban form um, than it is about sort of how that urban form co-evolves also with, with, with other factors, such as, um, you know, um, other urban infrastructure in terms of transport, um, urban greening, um, but also important sort of social cultural factors about, you know, to what extent uh, are real communities and social connections uh, being fostered in a city. Um, and, and again, my experience there with, 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 with Melbourne was that urban planners were, were too technical in terms of, you know, just thinking of we need to sort of have, you know, we have the magic number of so and so many people per square meter per square kilometer. That's going to make Melbourne a sustainable city. And that's sort of an extremely reductionist uh, perspective. Um, yes, 
Okay, thanks, Sid. Um, we should indeed now go for a break. Um, I'll be around um, if anybody wants to have a discussion, uh, but that's completely voluntarily. Uh, so, you know, go and have a break and get a coffee or whatever you would like to do. But